Hi, it's a pleasure to be here at the Arabic Game Jam. Um, I'm Karen Scoog, or you know, how Call it in. It. <laughs> um, and I'm the Game Localization Marketing Specialist at Language Automation Inc., uh, also known as LAI. And we are a 20-year-old video game translation and localization company based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and some of our clients include uh, Sony, Konami, and Ubisoft. And usually when I tell people that I do marketing for a video game translation localization company, they have to stop and, stop and think about what that actually means. So translation is the act of taking a game from one language and putting it into another, such as a Japanese game into English. While, local, while localization involves making aspects of the game culturally relevant for another market. This may include elements of translation, such as adapting jokes or celebrity references, but may also include compo other components so the games make sense to players while still maintaining the original feel of the game. Our primary business functions ensure that it isn't just being text and audio that translates across borders, but all content, such as game art. For example, the release of World of Warcraft expansions in China uh, faced significant delays while aspects of the game were entirely redone for the Chinese market to include the covering of skeletons, the, the covering of bones on all skeletons. Mm -hmm. Given the sheer number of Chinese gamers, those delays to market were significant as millions of players were unable to access new game content. If you're interested in learning about localization in greater depth, you can also check out our blog post um, and it discusses the range of in-game localization from what we like to call simple localization to full culturalization, where an entire aspects of the game are adopted to meet the needs of the market. Now, since some of you might be interested in the field of game translation, I'll also cover some of the core skill sets um, of our translators at LAI before we dive into the game development in the theater region. Um, game localization is a specialized field because it involves knowledge of multiple languages, uh, cultures, and of course, video games. Since translation requires balancing many aspects, such as client expectations, gamer expectations, screen space, and untranslatable references or idioms, there is a certain amount of creativity that translators need to exercise. For example, German words can take roughly 30% more space than English for UI elements. So there may be instances in which translators need to creatively adapt the text to work it into the allotted space. And because of this, we, per we prefer to hire translators with creative writing experience and capabilities. So our translators are also gamers themselves, so they have a deep understanding of gamer culture and game worlds. It is nearly impossible for a bilingual to translate a game without their understanding of video games. It would be like telling my parents about the rare, the rare drop that I got in an instance during WoW. Their eyes would just glaze over and I would basically be speaking a foreign language to them. Well, while you wouldn't want someone who doesn't understand gaming culture to translate games um, because they wouldn't be able to translate games properly, our, translate, our translators also reside in the country of their target language. Uh, um, so our Arabic translators are uh, located throughout the Middle East and Scandinavia and Scandinavia. So this ensures that they remain up to date with both cultural and linguistic trends, um, such as slang, because that's constantly changing. So how does game localization relate to the Arabic game jam? Well, the great thing about what you are all doing is that you aren't just taking a game from Europe and adapting it for the MENA region. You are actually creating games with the Middle Eastern market in mind, with the Middle Eastern gamer in mind, and that's fantastic because gamers in the MENA region are looking for games made for them. Too often, Arabs are portrayed from a very superficial and often offensive perspective in games and on TV. In the show Homeland, Palmer Street is depicted as a rundown and quite dangerous street, when in actuality, it looks like this. Um, a vibrant street, and one of the most famous in Beirut, with many shops and cafes. While some game developers may not hesitate to use stereotypical contents within their games, Today, you have the opportunity to create games that show a different side of the Middle East, games that reflect something more about the culture and the people. And I'm glad to see so many of you here today, as this confirms a trend that LAI has been tracking for a while. More and more people are now seeing games as a medium, uh, as an effective medium for conveying culture. Developers from emerging markets have been increasing over the past few years, 
as gamers love to see their daily lives reflected within their games. While Japanese culture has long been integrated into the media, the rise in other cultures appearing in games is still a relatively recent phenomenon. This trend includes games like Apotheon, based on ancient Greek pottery, Anansi the Origin, based on a folktale from Ghana, Ku, based on Irish mythology, Mithlan, based on the Mexican Day of the Dead, and Pew and Collector, based on the indigenous people in parts of Chile and Argentina. Aside from Apotheon, each of these games were developed by any developers from the region, from the regions reflected within these games. Now you can learn a lot by looking at examples from developers um, throughout the world, since each has a different approach to integrating the culture into games. At LAI, we have been learning more about this trend to gain a better understanding of the global market and international game development. Last year, we developed an interview series to speak with game developers from around the world, creating what we like to call uh, culturally based and regionally inspired games. For example, Arturo, a developer from Mexico City, told us that his company, Fine Games, incorporated <coughs> elements from Day of the Dead into their game with Mark. And while many games within the game are symbolic of the festivity, the game doesn't come out and specifically say, this achievement stream represents ofrendas, or altars used to remember and honor the deceased during Dia de los Muertos. Players can go and research the symbol of their life, or they can just enjoy the game as is. Fortunately, you already see the value in creating games for a specific market. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here today. So I'll just touch on these reasons briefly before we get into the linguistic and cultural considerations of the Lunar region. There are two primary advantages in developing games for Lunar gamers. First, it will differentiate your game from all other games in the, market space, in the marketplace. And second, you are catering, you are, sorry, directly catering to an underserved market. When articles refer to culturally focused games like Apotheon, they, uh, they often write something like, tired of games that look like every other game? Maybe Apotheon's for you. This means that these kinds of games don't only have appeal within local markets, but they also have appeal across international markets. In fact, an experiment by Zynga revealed that culturally focused content does well not only within the target region, but across all markets. I'm gonna play a short video clip for you. generic content would kind of play better to a global audience. So in other words, if you're playing if you're playing Cityville or you're playing Farmville and you're offered something that is kind of culturally non-specific, so just a typical building or a typical crop, uh, what we would find, the assumption was, well that's going to be more appealing because it's a little bit more sort of neutral across all these platforms. As we started doing testing around international content, we found out that Actually, content customized for the global markets performed better by a significant margin. So, and not just in that local market. So if we were to have uh, Indonesian themed content going through our games, it would perform as you would expect, not only disproportionately well in Indonesia, but then it would also perform extremely well in all other territories also. So there's a real appetite for this kind of culturally specific content. And um, so this experiment shows that there is a place for cultural elements across global audiences. And this has also been seen in TV shows. El Cron is a telenovela or soap opera set in the Middle East, dealing with Muslim topics and customs, but was originally developed for the Brazilian market. Yet this Middle Eastern content did extraordinarily well across Latin America and Latino audiences, becoming one of the most successful telenovelas of all time, and was even brought from Latin America to the Middle East. This shows that content focused on a specific culture will not necessarily be limited to commercial success within a single marketplace, since certain cultural themes may resonate across international markets. For example, Garshat, the, the, the Monster Slayer, is a game about a mythological Persian hero that was developed in Iran and did well internationally. Now one way that you could differentiate your game while following a tried and true model 
is to create a game reminiscent of, say, Marvel, Marvel vs. Capcom, but using Middle Eastern superheroes, such as those from the Middle Eastern comic book, The 99. The Letty Games from Ghana is developing a game along this concept, integrating figures from African folk tales to perform superhuman feats. And the second advantage to developing games specifically for arena gamers is that you are catering to a vastly underserved market. By focusing solely upon MENA and Turkey, Peak Games was able to rise to the number three position for social gaming companies worldwide in just one and a half years. They were able to achieve this success by catering directly to linguistic and cultural considerations for the region, since there are few companies creating games specifically for the market. Plus, gamers within the Middle East, uh, within the Middle East monetize better than gamers in other regions. Youth in Arab Gulf countries feel as though they have few entertainment outlets, resulting in an average daily revenue per user at one of the highest in the world. That's according to Peak Games. This is an exciting time to develop games for the MENA region. Nuzu estimates that the region has the highest compound annual growth rate in the world at 21%. Also, this article on Reuters predicts a promising future for gaming in the Middle East, stating that about 60% of 350 million people <coughs> in the Arab world are younger than 25, with internet penetration in the region at about <coughs> 70 million users. And that's over 300% growth within the last five years. And internet penetration is also expected to reach 150 million users by 20, 2015. The expected growth in the coming years makes the MENA region a highly attractive market for game developers, publishers, and investors. In this article, NTV also noted that Arab video gaming is interesting because it follows um, internet growth in the region, which is among the fastest in the world. Since experts cite the region as a key emerging market, game developers and publishers have been eyeing the region for some time. Ubisoft has an office in Abu Dhabi, and other global companies make it a point to engage with local players, local game developers, at the Dubai World Game Expo, such as EA, Konami, Sony, Square Enix, and Greek. But this focus on the MENA region is still a relatively recent trend, but with more of the companies targeting the, MENA, or targeting the region and more experts proclaiming it to be one of the world's fastest growing, we can expect the MENA gaming industry to grow significantly, significantly in the coming years. Similar predictions for, the Latin America, for Latin America resulted in the incredible growth of game development university programs and the increased interest by foreign organizations. Last year, companies came from Asia to Mexico in order to recruit development talent and forge partnership, partnerships with Mexican studios. And this past fall, Square Enix announced the results of their Latin American game contest, which they initiated to find top development teams within the region. The goal of the contest was to find a studio that Square Enix could partner with, collaborate with, to work on, uh, to develop games for the Latin American market. Now, the, with the industry in the Middle East also on the rise, hopefully models like this can be replicated there, since MENA is the next up-and-coming region. Even Peak Games has taken their success within the Middle East and trying to replicate it for Southeast Asia. So there's a possibility that the MENA region could open up to other opportunities for growth by collaborating with game development initiatives in other emerging markets, such as Latin America and Southeast Asia. Many local players state that in order to reach MENA gamers effectively, gamer, games must be in Arabic and culturally relevant. Now that may sound simple, but one of the biggest challenges in targeting the MENA region are the many dialects of Arabic. While some of these dialects can be understood by, speaker, by Arabic speakers in other regions, others may be unintelligible. unintelligible. So unfortunately, a significant number of game developers and publishers think that they can get around the dialect dilemma by releasing games in modern standard Arabic. And for those of you who aren't familiar with modern standard Arabic, it is the most commonly understood dialect. It is used for radio, newspapers, lectures, books, and subsequently feels very stiff and formal, since it's no one's native language. However, some games use this form of Arabic, even when the game's events take place within a specific Middle Eastern country. For games to sound natural to players, the, di the dialect needs to match the setting of the game. Otherwise, players will find the game jarring and virtually unplayable. 
Although FIFA used uh, FIFA 2012 to use some modern standard Arabic, it also used the voice of one of the most famous Tunisian commentators, so players thought the game worked really well. And while one dialect may work across multiple regions, there are some situations in which, in which it simply will not work. One example of this is the Need for Speed games, since the names of car parts vary greatly from one country to another, even in standard Arabic. In special cases like these, it might work better to use English or French. There's an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal that discusses the differences in these dialects and how it affects the dubbing of TV shows. The Syrian dialect is, perce is perceived to be more serious and therefore more well-suited for drama, whereas the Lebanese dialect is seen as ideal for sitcoms and Egyptian comedy. When the overall mood and tone of these dialects is not taken into consideration, it can result in a very strong disconnect between the audience and the content. Since the concept of immersion is such a hot topic among gamers, appropriate voice selection is critical in making the gamers become fully absorbed and engaged within the game. And I'll take a couple of examples from TV shows. Shows dubbed into Arabic can either be wildly successful or a huge flop, solely dependent on dialect selection, such as with the Teletubbies. So it was initially released in Syrian Arabic, and it was not, it was not received well in the MENA region. However, when it was dubbed into classical Arabic, it became an instant hit. Another interesting example is Law and Order, a serious crime show. The first time it was released, it was dubbed into Egyptian Arabic, and viewers just laughed at the show and couldn't take it seriously. The next time, it was dubbed into Lebanese Arabic, to which the viewers lost interest. Finally, it was put into Syrian Arabic, and that resonated with MENA viewers. So when you have a thorough understanding of these linguistic variations, you can be creative with dialects, like in Game Cook's game, Birdie Nom Nom, where the di development team voiced the birds in different regions into the appropriate dialects. Now, in order, to most, in order to most effectively reach MENA gamers, you must have an understanding of the market you're trying to reach and develop your games accordingly. It is simply too broad to say you're targeting the entire MENA region. And while it may seem overwhelming to sort through linguistic variations and markets within the region, you can narrow it down by focusing on your interests. Is there a region, a particular region you want to target? A certain theme you want to explore? A platform you want to develop for? Create content that will resonate for the region, or find a region that will be most receptive to the overall theme of your game, or the country that monetizes best for your preferred platform. Do research to find out which countries would be optimal for your development goals and preferences. One of, the most, or one of the first Western publishers to enter the Arabic-speaking world marketed their game Wally to Saudi Arabia, a country without movie theaters. Needless to say, the game was unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. On the surface, Egypt may seem like an ideal area to target. Egypt has a higher population than the entire Gulf region, plus Egyptian Arabic is largely understood across the MENA region. However, piracy is also a common issue whereas gamers in the Gulf region are more likely to buy original games. Platform popularity also varies by region, since uh, PC games are more popular in Egypt, PlayStation and parts of, in Western parts of the Arab world, and Xbox and Wii in the Gulf region as opposed to other parts of MENA. Local players recommend creating multiplayer games since these have some success in the region, and local developers also recommend making their games free to play. Here are some other great stats on individual countries in the region from research firm Ipsos. The UAE has the highest inter uh, internet penetration rate at 75%, followed by Kuwait at 64%, and Qatar at 61%. Egypt has the lowest rate in the region at 26%. Saudi Arabia and the UAE have the highest rates of smartphone penetration at 63% and 61% respectively while Egypt has the lowest at uh, 5%. Lebanon has the highest rate of mobile app downloads, with 70% of internet users having downloaded at least one app. Egypt and Jordan are both tied for the lowest rates of mobile app usage at 49%. Now, 63% of UAE's internet users download music, games, and videos, but only 23% do so in Egypt and Jordan has the highest rate of electronic game use across its entire population at 40%. These are important statistics to consider as you're um, creating your games. 
focusing on particular countries. So in targeting certain countries, it isn't just different dialects that you need to take into consideration. It is also cultural elements. One example of this is sports. While there are certain sports that simply do not exist in the MENA region, such as baseball, rugby, American football, and hockey, soccer, or football, I guess as we call it here, is popular across the region, whereas basketball is only popular in Lebanon. You also want to make sure that your game is easily accessible to MENA players. We saw this game on the previous slides, Travian. Um, it was created by a college student in Germany, and while five million people around the world play it, it is extraordinarily popular in the MENA region with roughly a quarter of players from Saudi Arabia and thousands of players throughout the region. Now, although Travion is a game about the Roman Empire, it has remained a popular game for MENA gamers. And why is that? It's because Travion only required internet access and Java to run, so it can easily be, easily be played on public computers. Software and hardware requirements can make the difference in between gaining thousands of players in the region to, uh, versus virtually none. Plus, Travian is a multiplayer game, which strongly appeals to players in the region. Now, in attempting to create a hit game for MENA gamers, you should also look to dialects, platforms, and system requirements that have worked for other game studios. Kirkwatt has seen great success in creating games for a variety of platforms, including PlayStation Mobile. Some of their games include Arabian Lords, a PC strategy game where players manage their own Middle Eastern city through the rise of Islam, this iPad game where players can play Middle Eastern music on a traditional instrument. And this Facebook and mobile game with three of the most famous or the most common forms of backgammon in the region. The diversity of Kirkwatt's games show that there are multiple platforms and different kinds of cultural content that resonate across the Middle East. Peak Games, of course, is another fantastic company to look at, since they reached the top three place for social gaming companies in less than two years by focusing solely upon the gamers. Peak Games provides regional card games, background, and Arabized versions of games kind of like Farmville in Turkish, Arabic, English, and even some other languages. They even provide two versions of popular card games in the region, um, although players of one version can easily pick up the other. Now, despite the success of Peak Games, local, game, or local players consider a lobs version of Tarni card game more enjoyable since it uses the Egyptian dialect as would be used when playing with friends at home. So this emphasizes the importance of using dialects effectively, though there's also a balance you want to strike so you don't entirely eliminate sales from country by making games too local. In our interview series at LAI, we spoke with Wixel Studios and Game Plus, both of Lebanon both independent studios that integrate local cultural elements into their mobile games. Wixel Studios' recent game, Survival Raids, is a creative spin on that theme, since unlike game studios that create virtual copies of real-life games, Wixel Studios created an original game involving a botanist and a wee-wee car racing champion saving the world from the anti-plants terrorism agency. Now, Wixel is hoping that Survival Raids will find a place in their international market, though they incorporated plenty of elements that will also resonate with MENA gamers, including art style and themes like car racing, which is popular in the Gulf region. The other game that we really interviewed was Game Cooks, which had two games at the time, Birdie Nom Nom and Run for Peace. And Birdie Nom Nom is another creative take on local culture. It is a mobile game about mutant chickens invading the Middle East, and the development team even used multiple dialects of Arabic for the voices of the chickens to reflect the settings of the different stages. Now, Run for Peace takes the opposite approach. Instead of world domination, the game takes us down to world peace. Um, it's a run and jump game in which a young boy runs across the Arab world and he spreads peace to each of the countries that he runs through. The boy's name, Salim, is inspired from the Arabic word salam, meaning peace. And another great example of incorporating Middle Eastern culture into the game is Farsh, a puzzle game with carpets created by a developer from Iran. It's a simple concept yet highly effective. I hope this overview of games from the region shows you that there is no one right way to approach regionally inspired games. Successful developers in the region 
that use a variety of cultural themes, game platforms, and, and language options to reach Middle Eastern players. Do as much research as you can and talk to people from the region. Now, one of my favorite parts about growing up in the San Francisco Bay Area is, was the cultural diversity. So during middle school, I learned just as much, or perhaps even more, from my friends about Chinese culture and Islam in particular, as I did from my history classes. And for those of you who live here in Malma, you are just as fortunate to live in such a diverse area. If you're passionate about creating games with Arabic content, speak to people from the region or visit there if you can. Learn as much as you can about the culture and different perspectives on Middle Eastern life so you can create content that more realistically reflects the people and what matters to them. If you believe that you are already an expert on a particular Middle Eastern country and the surrounding area, help educate others and help them cultivate their ideas. You can also expand your own knowledge of the region by speaking to people from uh, across the Middle East. This will only broaden your perspectives and help make games a richer and more diverse space, creating an assorted collection of, gamers, or of games for every kind of gamer. Anyone can re regurgitate cultural stereotypes, but it takes real creativity and genu a genuine interest to develop a truly original game for Arab gamers. Feel free to email me if you have any questions. Um, also, I'll be in the Stockholm area over the coming one and Oslo in July. And if you're there, let me know and we can also chat one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so thanks for having me here and I wish you all the best of luck with the Arabic. Arabic.